Good morning, Martin! Good morning, and thank you so much for the intro, Vassos. It's been a long time since I've seen you. I hope you're well. Very well, thank you, Martin. How are you? I'm good. We used to sit sit near each other on Five Live when I did my Five Live show, Chris, <laughs> Vassos yes. and I. We oh. know each other from, from his past incarnations, yeah. Vassos' his past radio incarnations. Plenty of water under the bridge since then. Um, congratulations, Martin, on just being brilliant and, and wonderful to have around. <laughs> how, does it, how does it feel to be such a good guy? <laughs> Oh, no, well, it's lovely of you to say so. As you know, you never look at those things when it's yourself. I have to say, it's a lot of pressure the last few years. You know, it's uh, being the money-saving expert amidst the pandemic and then the cost of living crisis, when the, when at one point we were looking at the risk of people having to choose between heating and eating on energy bills, was maybe not as nice as it possibly seemed, just to bring the mood down for a moment. I mean, hopefully we're, we're starting to move towards at least the middle or the beginning of the end of the cost of living crisis, though there's a long way to go. So um, I, I'm not as good guy as it seems. I just uh, hopefully do my job well. You are. You're brilliant, Martin. I, I'll say that about you because you, you won't accept it or, and you definitely would never say it. Even think about it, uh, as far as yourself is concerned. So you're now you're not a telly veteran, but you are a seasoned professional. Your team, I know it's in. This is not breaking news, but your TV shows in its eighth year. It's really good, Martin. Thirteen. So is it thirty? Sorry, I apologise. Twenty twelve. We started. Sorry, uh, sorry. The year my daughter was born. Yeah, I apologise. Um, does it see? Do you, you seem to be having all the fun? You seem to absolutely live and breathe it. Uh, how how is it at your show? Oh, I mean, I love my show. I, you know, we, when it very first started, I should say 13th series, 12th year, just yeah, in case someone's sorry. doing the maths and going, yeah. oh, he's meant to be a numbers person. He just got that totally <laughs> wrong, he did. Not as wrong as me. 13th series, 12th anyway. year. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Okay. Um, <laughs> And so when, when it first started, ITV were really pushing. They wanted it all to be entertainment. So we did these film sequences, which, which which did okay. And I'd try and get my stuff in and we'd do these setups with case studies. And often the case studies wouldn't be quite right. And we'd have to, you know, they'd make me, at one point, it was jumping the shark. It really was. And I was not happy. They made me, go, we sat a, a raft on a swimming pool and we did this Titanic scene. And then I had to go under, under the water when it was, two degrees and it was absolutely it didn't work and this the show gradually morphed and then when it all really took off was during the pandemic when we went live and i'd said for years i said can we just stop flanneling around with this stuff i mean that the, the odd bit of funny in the middle what people really want is the raw content and they want it as, as soon as possible and actually once we went live what live everything just changed and the show has gone from strength to strength on that i mean i write it so tomorrow's show for example um, I'm writing my weekly email on Money Saving Expert at the moment, which this week happens to be on the same subject as the show. It's Bill Buster. Uh, it's all about how to cut all your big bills, big and easy savings. So I'm writing my weekly email today where I'm doing all the research, working with my team. Then tomorrow morning is when I actually start on the show. I write the graphics in the morning and it's all, all about the graphics getting going. I deliver those to the team about 12. I then walk in, we do a production meeting. And then in the afternoon, it's often about polishing the graphics. And then uh, we get there and a lot of the questions are coming through as you go. And as you'll know, doing an Ask Me Anything on, on big subjects like bills live on primetime telly is um, brown trousers broadcasting. Well, it doesn't come across as that. It comes across as you absolutely love it. And it's super fueled love it. by the fact it's live. And it so clearly comes from you, the show. So, you know, it comes from you. You, you I say you live and breathe it. It doesn't come via you. It's quite clear with the confidence with which you deliver what you're talking about, that you are not only the, the platform and the loud hailer, but you're also the source. There's a very famous show in America, which you know, you'll know about, some people know about, called Mad Money. And it's on every day this is a show you could do that show every day couldn't you i could except that i wouldn't have the time to do the research to do the show right okay that it's it's all the feet beneath the water it's the the fact that you can come in and deliver all that information is about doing all the work in advance you know and constantly i, I took my my new co-presenter jeanette quatch is a former olympic athlete and we were having a conversation about this and actually, when I discussed her, her training patterns with her, I realized that my life is, you know, sadly not physically, a bit like being an athlete. Um, I'm constantly in training to keep the knowledge up so that I can answer the questions, you know, without notice of what the questions are. You just have to keep working at it. And when, if I go, like, I was off for a couple of weeks over Christmas. And when I came back, I deliberately, my first week coming back, I had no broadcasting done because I was out of shape. 
so financially, if you know what I mean, <laughs> mentally. And I needed that first week to get back into trading before I could go back and start answering the questions again. Yeah. It really does work a bit like that. So that that would be the problem. I know Mad Money. He talks even quicker than I do. Yeah, no, um, I'm a big fan of Mad Money. What's his name? Jim? What's his name? Jim? Jim Kramer? Cr- Cr- oh. Is it Jim Kramer or something like yeah, that? Yeah, Jim Kramer. That's exactly his name. Precisely his name. So, um, Martin, what were you like as a kid and with money in your pocket money? You know, and the first pound you ever saved or earned. Tell us, tell us about that. Have you always been this sort uh, of um, conscientious, this sort of uh, engage with with finances for the good of yourself and therefore vicariously in the end everybody else. When I was a little kid, I, my, my sister, my older sister and I, she, we used to get the same pocket money in class. Basically, she would always spend it and I would always save it. Right. So, you know, we'd come to a time, we'd be going out when we were 10 or 11 and and she would have no money and I would have saved £10 or something. I can't remember our pocket money was a quid or, or two quid a week uh, or something in that ilk. And then what my father would do, which I still berate him for now, is he would then, because she didn't have any money, he would give her more money. Yeah. And and now as I'm saying to him, Dad, that was complete moral hazard. You know, there I was, <laughs> diligently saving, yes. doing absolutely everything right. And but you were rewarding the one who spent their pocket money. Mm. So, you know, I managed to get where I am without my father's bad lessons. So where did that come uh, from then, do you think? Well, it's a mathematical thing, is the truth of it. Uh, I've always been math math based and I always thought about it. And um, you know, I after university, I went and did a postgrad in broadcasting and I'd worked uh, in, in city PR beforehand. And when I remember doing that postgrad, I, I took out the maximum loan I was able to do, a professional studies loan, which was interest free, even though I didn't need it. And I put it in a high interest account. And I used that high interest is what got me a nice holiday on the Christmas holidays when I was on the course, because I the interest from the account that I borrowed interest free, even though I didn't need it, which I now know is called stoozing. And once I got later a lot along, because I'm the type of person, there are lots of other people like this who's always been you know when you do money you do your research you do your practice you do the numbers you think about it and then I started to think um broadcasting is there a way to codify this and professionalize it because it hadn't really been done before when I started there was Alvin Hall was on the telly and Alvin is a uh, he was great but he's a stop spending expert not a how to play the system expert and and that's really where it all came from it became a sort of a codification of the way I naturally operated but much more professional. And of course, what you do when you do it as my job, I research lots of things, even though they don't affect me. What most people who are good with money do is they research the stuff as they need it when it affects them. But my job is to research absolutely everything, even the things that have no relation to my own personal life. <laughs> and, and that's where it came from. Love it. Uh, so you set up MoneySavingExpert.com in 2003 for 100 quid. So a couple of questions there. Um, have you ever spent 100 quid better than that? What's the second best 100 quid you spent? Or is it up to you with the answer or not? And when you called yourself MoneySavingExpert.com, the pressure was on. But of course, youthful audacity would have played a role. So speak to that any way you like a bit if you don't mind yeah i i did i set it up i i actually think it was 80 pounds but i round it i round it up to 100 when i say because i can't remember that i actually i got a guy in uzbekistan on a uh, contracting website where you put it out to tender to build the first money saving expert uh, for either 80 or 100 quid uh there is definitely no investment i've ever done that's better than that you know the site is now absolutely mammoth people will know i sold it in 2012 but i still remain executive's chair i'm still absolutely in charge of it but the truth is when i set it up it was not to make money and in fact for the first seven months it had no way of making money it didn't didn't do anything and it was only when my server cost got to about two grand a month because the site had exploded and I couldn't afford that out of my job as a freelance you know money saving expert journalist that I had to find some way for it to make money on there my second best hundred quid I've ever spent oh I have no idea <laughs> sorry um, I know I'll, I'll, I'll do I'll do what do one that appears to you now go on uh, it's can I do 20 quid yeah sure and, and this this is only between us and a lot of people are growing this I bought a 20 year old nine wood off eBay. Nice. And as soon as I got that nine wood, suddenly between 150 <laughs> and 180 yards, my golf game worked. That was a very good 20 so, quid. I was so very it's happy with that. It's a persimmon. I'm guessing it's persimmon nine with a bit of, a bit of whipping, just where it's, the shaft it joins the shaft. And I'm guessing it's black with a red um, insert. And I'm guessing it's a pink. It's it's grey. It is persimmon. It's grey. Mm. Uh, it, it hits. I don't know what it is. It just suddenly the ball goes very wow. high and you can go over trees and it just lands straight. And I so a, my 20 quid nine wood off eBay. But the mistake <laughs> I made is I had a friend of mine who liked it and I got him a seven wood for yeah. about seven quid. 
and he's the guy I play golf with most often, and I'm very competitive idiot. with him. And it revolutionized his game way more. He lost like seven shots around, so and I dropped two shots around with it. So I, in some ways, I regret it. It's all about the money. Have you read that book, Commander in Cheat, by Donald Trump, about his golf game? No. Oh, it's amazing. It's a, it's a, it's a it? whole book. It's called Commander in Cheat, and it tells you everything you need to know about Donald Trump. Anyway, um, Martin, congratulations on everything, and congratulations on bagging that interview with the Chancellor. It's not your first or your last interview with the Chancellor, sitting Chancellor. Uh, he looked quite frightened of you. You got a few things over the line. Congratulations. <laughs> well done. Well, to be fair, I, I, you know, with any politician, and, and I have this when I'm presenting on Good Morning Britain or something, when it's on my subject area, I have been doing this, you know, 70 hours a week in and out for 20 years. They they are not going to be up to speed in the way that I am. Yeah. And that is quite tough to have an interview that way. But when I go and do an interview, it's not really about gotchas. It's more about sort of my Will, wish list. More from what the isn't it? Yeah. Top- yeah, it's more. So we got, I mean, the, the big one, and there'll be many, many young people listening who are very frustrated at the moment about what's going on in the housing situation, you know, and the difficulty of getting a first time house. And a lot of them will have this amazing product called a lifetime ISA. Right now, a lifetime ISA, you can put up to four grand a year in it. And then the state adds 25% on top. So if you put four grand in, it adds a thousand pounds on top yep. each year. Um, it, it should work really well. You can then use it either as a first time buyer or you can wait until you're age 60 at retirement. You can only open it aged 18 to 39. Now, one of the problems is when they launched this in 2017, it had a property price cap on that you could only use it to buy a house up to £450,000, which wasn't so bad then, but they haven't put that price up. That was 2017. House prices have gone up 30% 30 since then. And 26 of the 32 London boroughs, now the first time buyer average property price is over 450 quid. But the big problem with the lifetime ISA is if you take your money out, either not for a first time property or not once you hit age 60, and nobody is age 60 who's got this product because the maximum you get can be when you open it is age 39, is you have to pay effectively a penalty of 6.25% of what you put in. So if you maxed it for four years and you got 20 grand, you only get 18,750 quid in. And many people now, because they're being priced out over the limit, are having to take the money they save for their deposit out and they pay the penalty to the state. And it's absolutely ridiculous. So I wrote to the chancellor before the last autumn statement. He didn't do anything. And when I met him, you know, I put that to his face and said, come on, this is unfair. You have the state has encouraged young people to put money in lifetime ISIS to save for their first deposit. And now you, the state, is taking and once they've saved for 20 grand, you're taking over a grand off them. You're diminishing their deposit to buy the first time house. You know, and my suggestion is even if you don't want to increase the 450,000 pound limit, at least stop the penalty for those specifically who are buying their first time house. And I think I got that this time by his reaction. He's going to be in the budget. He didn't confirm it, but I'd call it 70% chances. Just to say to anybody listening, if you're aged 18 to 39 or you're a parent of somebody aged 18 to 39, probably at the younger end in that case. The other important thing to do with the lifetime ISA, I would strongly suggest anyone who's not bought a house and you're of that age, is go and open it with at least a quid now. I don't mind if it's only a quid. Um, a money box is the best pair at uh, 4.15%. But here's why you put a quid in. Because to use a lifetime ISA as a first-time buyer, the product has to have been open for a year. So if you put a quid in, then tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. Even if you're not planning to use it necessarily, once you put a quid in, the clock starts ticking. Then when you do plan to use it, you put your £4,000 in, you could get a grand added instantly and then use it straight away to buy your first time property. So you want to actually tick the box of having it open. So everybody aged 18 to 39 who has not owned a house, make sure you have put a pound in a lifetime ISA, even if you're not going to use it. Caveat, we should always do these things. If you decide it isn't for you and you have to take the money out later, then you may lose six and a quarter pence. Round of applause in the control room for that. Come on, that was live on the show. That was a moneysavingexpert.com tip live. <laughs> wow. That was just gifted to us. We didn't even ask for that. Martin, you're the best. You're the best. Don't go anywhere. Don't go anywhere. Uh, more questions. So you you said uh, to, to our team here, you could talk about credit cards, this and the other. Just let's talk, without getting into the weeds, about the philosophy of money. We know that money itself 
was the first line of credit because it was a promissory you note know, instead of bartering, you know, six bananas for six apples or whatever it was. Um, so then there's money, then it was getting into debt, then there was credit and credit cards, uh, and now it's more online. So you're getting further and further away from the physical thing, which makes it less painful to part with your hard-earned cash, especially now when it's just a transfer of digits from one bank account to another. And you coming on the show today, I was doing some, I was, I was thinking about something I heard over the weekend that Sweden is the first country to go cashless. Apparently it hasn't quite I think it's still 1% of circulating cash. You know, is cash on the way out? Money only works because we all collectively agree that it works. Exactly. Uh, fast forward to 100 years from now, zoom out to 50,000 feet from where we are at the moment. What do you think? What's going to happen in the next 10, 20, 30 years to money, to, to, to the buying and exchange of gifts and goods and services? Well, look, uh, as someone like you who, who virtually never uses cash, I do all my spending either on a debit card, yep. uh, one that gives me 1% cash back so that every time I spend, I get 1% of it back in cash or a credit card because paid off in full at the end of every month, have to say that, um, because then I get Section 75 protection, which is a legal extra protection you get with a credit card when buying something over 100 quid. Just as an aside, before I answer your question, very important people know this on credit card protection. The actual rule is you only have to spend a penny on the credit card and the credit card company is liable for the entire amount. So I had a woman who had listened to this. She bought a kitchen for 18 grand. The kitchen company went bust. She paid a hundred of it on the credit card. The rest of it she'd paid by bank transfer. Kitchen company went bust. She didn't get a kitchen. Uh, she went to the credit card company and said, I need my money back because you're jointly liable. They said no. She read my guide. It said, take them onto the financial ombudsman. And she was awarded all 18,000 pounds back because the credit card company is jointly liable for everything, even if you only spend a penny on the credit card, as long as the item is between 100 pounds and 30,000 pounds. That's an aside, but it's worth remembering that. Hang on, another round of applause country. for that. Hang on. Martin, here we go, and cue <laughs> round right. But to, go on, go on, go on. to answer your question yes. properly, yes. Funnily enough, I don't use cash, but I am very concerned about the withdrawing of cash in society. Uh, and I was part of a study on the back of this. There are many older people in our society who rely on cash. Uh, uh, and many older vulnerable people with onset dementia who rely on cash. So I actually think it's incredibly important that we protect cash in our society, uh, at least for the next 20, 30 years, uh, to make sure that we can fully get to the transition to a cashless society properly. There are other people who worry about the privacy issues uh, of going digital, especially when it's digital versus a fiat currency, where you know a national currency. I mean, I don't want to get into the politics of Bitcoin. There are many people who see Bitcoin as you know, the way of liberating yourself from the state. Uh, I, I'm not going to get involved in that particular debate, we're clearly moving to digital transactions. It has many benefits for swiftness, has many benefits for ease. Uh, it's sometimes not as easy to budget. And we see an improvement in the budgeting apps. And uh, one of the advantages of cash is if you have 200 pounds to spend in a week, you've got 200 pounds in your wallet. It is visceral and you can see what you have when you're budgeting very tightly. But certainly I think when our children are our age, I think cash will probably be a done deal. And that's not the worst thing in the world once we get there. But for the next 10 to 20 years, I'm one of those people lobbying to make sure that we keep cash because it's really important, really important for many older people who are being uh, disenfranchised from society by our digital economy when they can't use the internet and they can't go out shopping in many different ways. And we need to remember them, even all of us who um, don't use cash need to sort of get, just get behind protecting it a little bit. How come we all know about 1066, the signing of the Magna Carta at school, how volcanoes explode and Pythagoras' theorem, but there isn't an accounting O-level, mandatory? Well, well, there isn't. And, and you may know I, I campaigned to get financial education on the national curriculum. We succeeded in 24. I thought I had a big victory. It was a Pyrrhic victory. Uh, and the reason was quite simple. We got it on the national curriculum in England, I should say, in senior schools. It was a big debate. Uh, I remember actually, oh, I'll, tell, I'll tell you the story, you might like it. So the story was we wanted it to be fully and properly. We wanted it embedded in the mass curriculum and the citizenship curriculum. And we got in there and I had a final meeting. It was like, a, a imagine a smoke filled room. And it was me and Liz Truss, who was education oh, uh, minister at the time. Exactly. And um, they told me what they were going to do. And I was like, this, that just is not financial education. It's, it's not enough. 
you, you need to change the curriculum more. And we'd, we'd won maths teachers over who didn't originally like it, but then we showed data that putting real life examples into maths actually got many kids who wouldn't do maths normally more into maths. And then I said, you need to tell people it's financial education rather than just subtly put it in. And you need to ensure that they're using contemporaneous examples. You know, the examples need to be from today's rates, whatever the today's. So they need to go and get credit card leaflets out and talk about that type of stuff. So and and so it, they all wanted, obviously, they wanted me to say, yes, you have done what we asked. And that was my deal. And we cut the deal and we got it in 2014. So I thought we had this great victory. Two things then happened. Many of the people who've been funding financial education pulled out because they said the state was doing it, but the state put in absolutely no resources and the state also changed the rules so that most schools no longer need to follow the national curriculum because of the academization and free schools. So we got it on the national curriculum and it didn't mean much. I then four years later had a meeting with the next education minister and he said, what we really need is a textbook. And I said, yes, we need a textbook. He said, we need a textbook. I went, yes, we need a textbook. He said, we need a textbook. And I thought, this is getting a bit circular. Where's this going? And I said, I said, yes, I, I, I agree with you. Absolutely. You should do a textbook. He went, no, no, you should do a textbook. I said, what? He said, you should do a textbook. And I thought, but, and he said, we, 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 we can't resource it. And I thought, no, you can't resource it. You've put nothing into teaching it in schools. You put nothing into teacher training. You put nothing into ongoing teacher training. And you're telling me I should do a textbook. So I, I went and I worked with a charity called Young Money. I agreed I'd fund a textbook. And we went back and we asked for their support. And they said, no, no, we can't support it. I said, why? Because you're going through a publisher. I said, sorry, you want me to do a textbook, <laughs> but I can't go through a publisher. You said, yeah, we can't support any individual publishers. So I thought, um, What's that place in Thailand, Chris? You know that that that, that island in Thailand. I don't. Um, to be honest, I'm not up with Thailand. I, I, oh, I think it's Phuket. Is, Phu is no, it Phuket? Phuket. Yeah, Phuket. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, so I I thought of the island in Thailand. I thought Phuket, uh, lovely place in Thailand. I might, might as well do it myself. And so I then had to fund the publishing as well via the charity. Uh, we got the textbook out. Uh, it we I sent it free to all schools. Uh, and it, it is available and we've got teacher training packs and we're doing an adult version at the moment. But I still have this fundamental objection that a private individual should be paying for textbooks on a curriculum subject for schools, for state schools. I mean, that just seems absolutely wrong. Now, I put my... I put my pragmatics over my belief and did it anyway. And anybody, you can go and down that financial education textbook. It's on the Young Money Charity website. You can download the teacher's guide. We've since done, since that was the English version for Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, the uh, Money and Pension Service, which is the official non-government agency looking at, um, looking at money, went joint with me. Thank you very much. So we only paid 50-50 for the remaining textbooks. And anybody can download them for free. And they did go to school. So we have it available. But I still have a big problem. There's no teachers training. Many teachers aren't qualified to teach this in senior schools. And we have, it's not, many schools don't do it. So talk to your school, ask them if they do it. And the government and the state puts no resources into it. And just, just to put this in context, PPI, which I was involved in the campaign on, missed sole payment protection insurance, 40 billion pounds of that was missold and paid back. We heard last week that motor finance commissions, I believe may be as big as PPI, the, the regulators dealing with it, it's not going to happen for another nine months. I'm going to be writing a guide on that. Could be as big as PPI. These huge mis-selling scandals, seismic, systemic mis-scandals by some of the biggest financial institutions in the country, £40 billion paid back. If 0.01% of that was put into financial education by the state, we could perhaps be in a situation by far, far fewer people are ever missold in the first place. So we don't have to go through the rigmarole of educating people to get their money back. And yet we do diddly squat and they rely on private individuals to fund the resourcing of fi financial education in schools, even though it's on the national curriculum. So damn right you are, Chris, that we, we should be doing something and much more than we are doing. It's a disgrace that we haven't. I will keep the campaign going. But, you know, the energy does start to start when you bang your head against a brick wall time and time again on this. OK, you've done it again. Control room round of applause. Listen to this. We shouldn't be on a radio show. We should be on a stadium tour. Oh, my goodness me, Martin. You're amazing. You're so amazing. You're so such a wonderful human being. Um, it begs the question, doesn't it? And everybody's screaming at the radio. Why? Why don't they want children to know about their future finances and how to sort them out?
Um, but that's a question for another day. And probably, I think it's probably because because we need to teach the academic stuff, and it's this whole battle between life skills and the curriculum being yeah. very busy. But it's more about them not resourcing it, just yeah. resourcing. No, I, I get mean, it. I'm talking, I get it. talking low number millions. It's nothing for their education budgets. I get it 100. Uh, percent Just before you go, and um, we're almost out of time. And thank you for making the time because you don't have time uh, for this kind of stuff. So that's I'm really, true. really, really grateful. No, I'm really grateful. I get it. I get it. We've been waiting weeks for this, so I'm so, so thankful. Um, we have a friend called Sean Conway. He's a brilliant runner. He's currently held the world record for the most um, Ironmans in a row, 105, day after day after day after day. And he's he's launched this challenge for people to feel a bit of his juice and be inspired by him. It's You run 1K on January the 1st and two on the 2nd and third on the th- three on the 3rd, and you get to 496 kilometres by January the 31st. You have a very similar initiative um, called the 1P Challenge, the Savings Challenge. This is so much fun. Tell everyone about it. Tell them how much, how much it's going to cost them to join the party later here on Planet. January the 15th, 2024, and uh, any any other fun ideas? We've got a minute left, Martin. Uh, yeah, so the 1P challenge is very simple. You put a penny in on the 1st of January, two penny in the 2nd of January. By the end of the year, you get to £3.66 because <laughs> we're in a leap year and you have nearly 700 quid saved. Wow. And it's about getting people into the savings habit. There are so many different ways. Just getting putting money aside to give you a little bit of financial resilience. Should say anybody who's on universal credit, there's a help to save scheme where uh, you put money in and the state will boost it 50% on top. On the maximum you have in over two years, you can put up to 50 quid in. So if you put £600 in the help to save scheme, scheme and then you had to take it out because you had an emergency and you didn't couldn't put any more in you'd still get a 50 percent bonus on the most you had in so that would be 300 quid on the 600 wow, pounds if so you're good. on uc or benefits check that one out but anyway one penny on the first day and the whole point of that is getting to habits lots of other things that can build habits no spend days if you struggle a bit decide, designate one or two days a week where you will not spend any money whatsoever and it starts you get into the habit of controlling your finances some people need that impulse control other people don't need the impulse control but the saving <laughs> challenge Anything that builds you some resilience, gives you a nest egg, gives you a little bit of cash saved away when you have problems, helps you sleep at night. And if you're in really bad debts at the moment, National Deadline, Citizens Advice Bureau, Bureau, Step Change or Christians Against Poverty, do not go to a commercial debt company. But if you're losing sleep over it, you can't make your middleman payments, go and get some professional one-on-one help from one of those debt counselling charities. And again, hopefully you'll get a better night's sleep. I do chair the Money and Mental Health Policy Institute. Mental health and money, sadly, are inextricably linked. That's why he has to speak so quickly because he's got so much to get done. Martin, thanks for your time, man. Thank you for having me. He's the best, isn't he? He's the best. The Martin Lewis Money Show Live, Series 13. It's written down here. How come I got it wrong? Continues tomorrow, 8 p.m. on ITV1, and you can catch up on the whole series and all the other series on ITV. Catch up. Radio.